Hi, my name is Jake Vossenkemper, Director of Agronomy and Research here at Liquid Grow. So this morning, dur during this morning's Lead Academy session, we're going to talk about how to fertilize with potassium strategically. So in other words, there's many ways that you can fertilize with potassium, but how do you do it in the most cost-effective, efficient manner to increase yield and ROI, okay? So, you know, in agronomy, there are oftentimes many ways to skin a cat, but really my job is to do exactly what I just described. How do we understand the most efficient, cost-effective way to get the nutrients of the crop? And sometimes that depends, right? But with, well, with potassium, there's some specific considerations that, to take into account. So on the screen here, you should be seeing what we call a potassium response curve. So what this curve is, is it's looking at soil test potassium level versus yield. And the one thing that should strike you about this relationship is that the relationship is pretty rough. So in other words, you know, once you get above about 225 part per million of potassium in the soil, yields are more or less maximized. But in between 100 part per million and 180 part per million, there's a lot of variation. So in other words, in some cases, you might achieve maximum yields with 140 part per million potassium. In other cases, you might only get 65% of maximum yield. So what causes that? Well, potassium is a fickle nutrient, and so I'm going to describe some of the things that causes this variation. Um, for example, in the drought of 2012, uh, at the time I was working for a seed company, and I was charged with evaluating many experimental hybrids. And in those experimental sites, there were some hybrids that had no potassium deficiency, and there were others that had severe potassium deficiency. And so that's because the soils were very dry and limiting potassium uptake. Yet some hybrids were still able to access potassium and take it up, and others weren't. So there's a lot of genetic variation for potassium uptake, efficiency, so on and so forth. There's a lot of genetic variation, okay? So that could explain some of the variation you see in this data. You also have to keep in mind that when roots are working less efficiently, let's say you had rootworm injury, uh, let's say that you had a you know, fungal disease on the roots. When the roots are operating a lot less efficiently, it takes a lot higher concentration of potassium to maximize yield. That's another example. We also know that uh, magnesium can suppress potassium uptake. So in other words, if you have soils with high magnesium levels, it's likely going to take a higher concentration of potassium to maximize yield. We also know that some clays, two, two to one clays in particular, um, smectitic clays, can tie up a lot of potassium. So in other words, um, when it gets dry, uh, the potassium can be trapped between those clay layers. So if you're in a heavy clay soil, if it has the right min mineralogy, it's going to take a lot, of, lot more potassium to maximize yield than if you weren't in that soil. On the other hand, we know that sandy soils in general, or lighter textured soils, generally take a lot lower concentration of potassium. And then finally, uh, soil testing is not perfect by any means. And particularly with potassium, we can see a high amount of variation just in soil testing on its own. Um, the laboratory methods aren't perfect, the sampling schemes aren't perfect, and you can see a lot of variation in soil test potassium levels just from errors due to sampling and or the lab. So there's lots of reasons why potassium can be challenging, okay? So one way to overcome the unknowns about do you have enough potassium in the soil or do you not would be to build, um, build your fertility levels above that 225 part per million threshold. You know, if you look at this figure here, once you get greater than 225, generally speaking, yields are always maximized. But then reality sets in. And the reality of that is, let's just say hypothetically you were at 140 part per million, which many fields are at 140 part per million. You know, just how much potassium would it take for you to get to only 200 part per million, okay? It would take approximately 540 pounds of actual potassium or 756 pounds of potassium chloride or muriate of potash, okay? And while Liquor Grow would love to sell you all that potassium, and in some cases that might make sense actually, in other cases in non-secure lease situations, that definitely does not make sense, okay? So just to give you an idea, 
you know, to get to go from 140 to 200 200 par per million, that would cost you approximately $260 per acre, and that's not even taking into account what those crops are, what the corn and soybean crops are going to remove. So the truth is, it's going to take you more than $260 per acre. But assuming you grew, you grew no crop, it would cost you $260 per acre to go from 140 to 200 par per million. Okay, and in situations where you know you have a long land tenure, you own you own the ground, it may make sense to build to that level, right? But but you know that's one of the only ways that you're going to guarantee you're going to maximize yield is to get above 200, 225 par per million salt SK levels. But the question I have is, could we be more strategic about it? Are there ways to get around having to build and maintain on every acre? We're going to pause there, and we're going to come back to this question in a minute. The next couple of figures I'm going to show you are uh, large soil uh, test data sets that uh, the International Plant Nutrition Institute originally put together. Uh, now uh, this information is, is housed and stored by the Fertilizer Institute. But I want to explain a little bit about these figures here first. This is the distribution of all, all soil test potassium, all soils that were tested for potassium in the state of Iowa, for example, right? So. 38% of those samples were above 200, 200 part per million. So in those cases, you know, we would say you're probably pretty good. 23% of those samples were in the zone where, you know, you need to be replacing nutrients. But 40% of those 1 million samples were low to very low, right? So there was a large number of acres and or samples that came back low and very low. So it's, it's a Potentially, it is a large issue. I see lots of potassium deficient soil tests. This summer, it was very dry early on. Saw lots of potassium deficient fields. This is the same thing for Illinois. Uh, there's only about a half a million soil samples in this data, but roughly about 52% of the samples were in that very low to low soil test, pota soil test potassium level categories, right? So just use this data to show that there are significant acreages with very low potassium levels. And I can't overemphasize enough how important potassium is. And another thing that I didn't explain early, earlier on is that another thing that can really affect how much potassium you need in the soil is the, the moisture content of the soil. So when the soils are moist, potassium moves through the soil water via diffusion when soils are dry, potassium cannot move very effectively through soils via, via diffusion, okay? So another thing that could cause all that variation is soil moisture conditions, all right? And before I go on any further, I just want to explain how important potassium is in a drought. It regulates water movement. It opens and closes the stomata. So potassium is always important, but when things get dry, potassium becomes even more important in a drought. So I'm just going to briefly mention the findings of a study that was published in 2020. Just to give you a little background, the soil test levels in these experiments were about 121 part per million, so very low to low. Um, this is the average of 10 hybrids, the data I'm going to show you next, and all the hybrids showed the, a, a very similar effect. So they had two different K fertilizer levels. They had a 50 uh, pound per acre treatment and they had a 75 pound per acre treatment. And what I want you to notice is, you know, there was roughly a 9 to 13 percent yield increase over no K fertilizer um, in the well watered situations and the irrigated situations. But in the droughty soils, there was a 20 and a 37 percent yield increase to fertilizing with potassium. So potassium is so important in dry conditions, you can't afford not to have sufficient potassium levels. So, here comes, you know, the option is to spend north of $260 per acre to guarantee that potassium is not going to be problematic for you or to guarantee that the next dry year isn't going to cause you large yield losses. Or you can think about strategically fertilizing with potassium. And so I have an example here of what I'm trying to get at on the slide. So let's just hypothetically say that you had 100 pounds, you, you know, you had the financial resources to buy 100 pounds of K, okay? If you were to broadcast that K and incorporate it into 
six inch depth, which is an acre furrow slice, you would increase the soil test concentration by approximately 11 part per million. If you were to take that same 100 pounds of K and fertilize an eight by eight inch, an eight inch uh, a, a band, an area of the soil that's eight inches wide, and you incorporate that to a six inch depth, you're gonna change the approximate soil test potassium level by 42 part per million. And that eight by six inch area that I just described is the approximate area where a corn plant is gonna take up the majority of the potassium that's applied to it. So that's thinking about strategically placing potassium. So instead of having to build the entire acre, you build the acre where you're gonna plant the crop and where the crop's gonna take up the most potassium from the soil, okay? So that's what I mean by strategically thinking about using potassium. So next we're gonna talk about, you know, what are the different approaches that you could use to strategically apply K? And we're gonna talk about some research that I've done I'm going to show you, you know, kind of the journey that I've went on to come up with the best recommendation to date. Okay, so starting back in 2017, I did an on-farm trial from 2017, I think, through 2019. And what I did is I applied 30 pounds of actual potassium in season uh, at approximately V5 to V9, so an early side dress timing. Um, and what I found, you know, across those 15, 16 sites is that, um, most definitely unequivocally in sandier soil. So roughly five of those 15 sites were sandier soils and I did that on purpose. What I found is that unequivocally, if you apply in season potassium, even if potassium was applied up front. So on average across all these sites, there was roughly 95 pounds of potassium applied either in the fall or the spring. So there was, there was pre-plant potassium applied at all these sites. And what I can tell you unequivocally that in sandier soils, there was definitely a yield increase to adding more potassium. In this case, it was 30 pounds. I believe the yield increase was roughly about 10 bushels per acre on average. So if you farm sandy soils, particularly if you know that they leach K, this would be a very good option for you to make sure you're maximizing bushels. And I'll also say that while I don't have any experimental evidence, I think that applying K in a wide drop situation is probably much better than adding K to your pivot irrigation. And I say that because I think what can happen is, you know, if you're applying an inch of water, you know, these soils that need irrigate, these sandy soils that need irrigation in our environment tend to be so sandy that some of that K that you're applying is leaching straight through and you need to position it by the root system where the roots can take it up. Again, I don't have any experimental evidence of that, but I just believe based on my experience, understanding of crop physiology and soil fertility, that's probably the much better approach. The other case where I believe without a question of a doubt that I've observed is that when we're trying to do a rescue application. So in other words, you know, we have dry soil conditions. Um, the crop is showing significant potassium deficiency. Um, can I save the crop by adding more potassium? The answer is absolutely yes. Or let's say that, you know, unfortunately, we planted the crop wet, it dried out, we have bad hatchet root syndrome, and we can't get the, the roots out of the furrow to explore for potassium. There's another example of when you can have potassium deficiencies and a, a strategy like this, wide dropping in season K, can be very helpful to overcoming that potassium deficiency. So we've done that in a number of cases, and you know I'm confident as can be that uh, a rescue application of K can be warranted and can be impactful to the to the crop. Some of these other sites, I'm not going to get into the details, but some of the normal sites, some of the heavier sites. There were definitely places where there were yield increases, particularly in the soils that were the most potassium deficient. But if you had 180 part per million, 200 part per million of potassium, and you fertilized, adding extra potassium at those sites wasn't very impactful on yield, okay? Another question you might be asking yourself, <clears throat> you know, what does potassium deficiency in corn even look like, right? So 
I'm kind of kind of going to describe mild potassium deficiency to severe potassium deficiency. And the first thing you need to recognize about potassium and corn in particular is that potassium is very mobile. Mobile. So the corn crop's really smart, right? So it knows that most of the photosynthesis, most of the light interception is in the is in the upper canopy. That's where most of the photosynthesis is happening. Corn will move potassium from lower light level concentration areas, so from the lower canopy up into the part of the canopy where most of the light's being intercepted and most of the photosynthesis is occurring. So because of that, you will see potassium deficiency show up in the lower canopy first. The first thing you're going to notice is some light burning along the leaf margins of the leaf edges. The next thing you're going to notice is necrotic leaf margins or leaf edges, so leaf edges that are starting to die, and the, the necrotic tissue will work in toward the middle of the, the leaf, okay? And you will start, you will start to see those symptoms uh, get worse as you go down toward the bottom of the plant. So they might be very light toward the mid canopy, but then they're going to intensify. Those necrotic edges are going to intensify as you go down into the canopy. Kind of the next level of potassium deficiency is intervenal chlorosis. So between the veins, you'll start to see yellowing between the veins. And that will be associated with necrotic leaf margins, okay? And so the crop can become so potassium deficient that the entire crop is yellow. You know, most of the leaves, except for the very newest leaves, have necrotic leaf margins and intervenal chlorosis. So that would obviously, along with stunting, that would obviously be the worst case potassium deficiency symptom. And I might also add the reason they're stunted is because water pressure elongates the nodes. And because potassium is so important to water regulation, the crop cannot regulate water the way it needs to. And therefore the nodes end up much shorter, stacked together versus a non-potassium deficient plant. So those are ways to recognize potassium deficiencies. So in the previous study, we talked about just applying K in season, and we applied 30 pounds of K. And what we found is that unequivocally in sandy soils or in rescue applications, adding potassium in season, definitely a good idea, okay? The next study we're gonna look at is what happens if you add other nutrients to that potassium application, okay? So in this study, this is small plot research now, not on-farm research, and the data you're gonna see here in a minute is the average of seven sites from 2020 to 2022. So in this case, we Y drop nutrients. We had a uh, nitrogen only treatment. And by the way, there was 180 pounds of nitrogen broadcast pre-plant to these sites. Then we added 40 pounds of nitrogen. We added 40 pounds of nitrogen plus 15 pounds of K. In the other study we were talking 30, now we're using 15 pounds of K. We added that same 40 pounds of nitrogen with 15 pounds of P. And then we had a 40 pounds of nitrogen, 15 pounds of P, and 15 pounds of K treatment. I also want to add that in this study, there were no pre-plant applied nutrients other than nitrogen. Okay, so we were really trying to get at, can you increase yields with in-season nutrients with as little as 15 pounds of P or K per acre and how much, all right? So in this study, we definitely increased yields with nutrients other than nitrogen by adding them in season. Just like I seen in the on-farm study, you know, we had a, on average, we had a little over about a two and a half bushel yield increase to adding 15 pounds of K in season. That shouldn't be shocking given we didn't apply any pre-plant K. We also had about that same roughly two and a half bushel yield increase by adding phosphorus in season. Again, probably not shocking given we didn't apply any pre-plant phosphorus. But finally, we saw that the biggest yield increase came from applying 40 pounds of P, or 40 pounds of N, uh, 15 pounds of P, and 15 pounds of K. So what this study answers is that unequivocally applying nutrients in season other than nitrogen can definitely increase yields. And we can definitely increase yields with as little as 15 pounds of potassium or phosphorus per acre when you apply these nutrients on the root system in season. And again, this would, be, this would have been done uh, as an early citrus application, V4 to V9 approximately. So with that study, we definitely increased yields by adding in-season nutrients. What that study didn't answer though is what happens if you applied nutrients, pre-plant nutrients or fall-applied nutrients, would you still say, see this same yield increase that I'm describing? 
And the, the answer to that question is, we will see. I have a study ongoing right now. Um, I actually have one year of data, but I'd like to have some more information before I make any hard conclusions. But I'm, I'm answering that question right now. If you applied a normal rate of nutrients pre-plant or in the fall, would you still say, see the same yield increase? I do have one study that I want to talk about that starts to get at the answer to this question. And in this study, what we did, um, we actually used our exact strip technology. Um, we applied 100 pounds of K per acre. So just as a reminder, with that exact strip technology, we are applying a band of fertilizer with RTK guidance, and then the farmer's gonna follow our RTK guidance lines or that band of nutrients and plant very near that band of nutrients, okay? And there's many videos we can put links in uh, for a further explanation of what that is. But in this study, what I did, and this is the average of three locations, I applied 100 pounds of potassium per acre, okay? The only thing that differed was the way the potassium was applied and the timing. So with treatment A, we applied 100 pounds of potassium per acre pre-plant with our exact strip technology. A couple weeks later, we came back and planted uh, into that band of fertilizer. With the other treatment, we applied 75% of that 100 pounds, so 75 pounds of K with our, with our exact strip technology. And then we came back and put the remaining 25% or 25 pounds on as a wide drop application. And in this study, what we found is that putting it on, putting the K on up front definitely increased yields more than holding back the remaining 25% and putting it on in season. Now this was all heavy ground, you know, normal silt loam, silt loam to silty clay loam soils, not sandy soil conditions. I would argue in sandy soil conditions, the second treatment where we split the application probably would have been better, but this is not the case with these sites. So what this study begins to tell us is that putting on the potassium applications, putting on that potassium strategically pre-plant is probably gonna be the best case scenario. Like I said, I have an ongoing study continuing to look at you know, what is the best approach. Um, but as of now, I would say that putting your potassium on pre-plant, um, all the potassium on pre-plant is probably the most efficient, not probably is the most efficient for you, for us. It's the most cost effective because the nutrients in the suspension are gonna be cheaper on a per pound basis than applying them in season. And you can get into some compatibility issues by blending nitrogen and potassium. Don't get me wrong, we know how to blend nitrogen and potassium. I'm just saying in some rare circumstances, there can be some compatibility issues. And because you're not using a suspension, you're getting into a high gallon per acre type product. So there, there are many cost advantages, logistical advantages of applying nutrients with the exact strip technology pre-plant. Uh, versus applying potassium, for example, in season. So finally, uh, we have the figure here of our distance study, and you know, roughly we're seeing about an eight bushel yield increase relative to broadcasting for the zero placement. And I think you know this just culminizes my suggestion on how to maximize yield with strategically placing K. So in other words, in the example that I'm describing here, let's say you have 140 part per million soil test level, you know, the option is, you know, spend $260 per acre to build fertility levels or strategically place K using the exact strip technology. So the most cost-effective, efficient way to strategically place potassium would be to use the exact strip technology. Uh, apply those exact strips in the fall or in the spring, well ahead of planting. Not to say that there aren't reasons to apply potassium in season. We talked about a couple experiments and we definitely can see yield increases. Um, just to review, those situations would be sandy soils or rescue type K applications. And there is an interesting interaction between nitrogen and potassium, and something I didn't get into, but I'll just briefly mention. I mentioned that magnesium can competitively inhibit K uptake. Well, so can ammonium, okay? So uh, this interaction looks like if you apply ammonium near the root system, you can actually suppress K uptake. And that's part of the reason why I continue to investigate, you know, is there a reason to apply potassium in season, even if you apply potassium up front? And I mentioned I have some ongoing studies looking at that. So there may be more to the story, but as of today, with all the research that I've done,
clearly the most effective, efficient way to strategically apply potassium is with our exact strip technology. So with that, I'm sure there'll be, I'm sure there'll be more to come. Thank you for joining this Lead Academy session, and I'm sure we'll talk to you soon. Lead Academy. Liquor Grow. Excellence. In agronomy. Development.